Hey everyone, welcome back. Really excited to continue our stock trading series by now taking a look at what happens if we try to trade stocks using the long short-term memory or LSTM model, which we just learned about in the previous video, which will be linked in the description below. So as a recap, before we get to the LSTM model, let's talk about why we are shifting over to the LSTM model. There always should be a motivation, a driving factor for why we're doing what we're doing. In the last video, we saw what happened if we used an ARMA, an autoregressive moving average model, in order to buy and sell stocks on each day of the week. Now, what I wanna run through here is the cons and pros of the ARMA model, because we wanna get a holistic sense of what is the things the ARMA model is missing in the cons column, but also what are the things that it's going to end up doing better than the LSTM model, so we know what we're gaining and what we're giving up. So in the cons column, one of the issues with the ARMA model was that we were only using the past returns of the stock to predict future returns. And although this makes a lot of sense on paper, there's many other factors that could go into a stock price prediction. For example, in this video, we're going to address that by adding just one more variable just to get our feet wet. And we're going to be using the volume or the total quantity of shares traded of a given stock on any given day. And just that could be useful because, for example, if very few shares are traded on a given day, maybe that's bad news for the stock because it means people aren't really interested. Or it could be that many, many shares traded on a given day is bad news for the stock because it means lots of people are dumping or selling the stock. There's a lot of volatility associated with the stock. Either way, we're going to let the model figure that out. But the fact is we're going to give an additional piece of information about each stock to our model, whereas we weren't doing that in the previous ARMA video, where we were just telling it what's the growth rate yesterday and the day before and the day before that. Now, ARMA models would be able to take into account those additional pieces of information. It's not like they couldn't do it. It's just less natural and less inherent to the structure of the ARMA model to do so versus an LSTM model, which as we saw in the LSTM video, is happy just to take in a arbitrarily sized embedding at every time step. Now the next and probably bigger con is that the ARMA models we looked at were strictly linear. And this is one of the appeals of them that makes them so easy to understand, which we see in the pros column here. But we see that if you're predicting the stock return on any given day, the ARMA model says, you know what, that's just a linear combination of the stock returns from let's say five days in the past and also the errors from five days in the past. Not too much going on there, it's all linear, pretty easy to understand, but although it's easy to understand, it may not capture the complex dynamics that exist, especially when you're talking about something as complex as stock return prediction. It's very unlikely this is a linear phenomenon in most cases, and therefore switching from a model that's purely linear to a model who has all these nonlinear activation functions because it's built off of our regular neural networks which have those activation functions, should allow us to capture more complex, more intricate dynamics in the data that we weren't able to before. And another huge con of the ARMA model was that we had limited time dependencies that we could take into account. So in the ARMA stock return video, we looked at figuring out the P and the Q order, the P being the order of the AR component, the Q being the order of the MA component, and we figured them out using the ACF and PACF plots. But at the end of the day, once we fixed a P and Q, like five and two, that was all the information the ARMA model was allowed to take into account during training. It's only allowed to look at five stock returns that came before it. It's blind to whatever happened before that. And that's one of the biggest drawbacks because when you think about stock return prediction, well, recent events can and probably do totally affect the stock price tomorrow, but also events further back in the past can have an effect. For example, there might be seasonality in stock price prediction. For example, if you think about stocks in some industry like agriculture, maybe the stock price goes up when there's a big harvest at a certain time of year and then goes down when there's not as much harvest at a different time of year. And so the LSTM model being built off of the vanilla neural network models we saw was able to take into account arbitrarily long time dependencies, whether that's five days, whether that's 30 days, whether that's 365 days or even more than that. And so these are all the cons of the ARMA model that we're trying to address using the LSTM model in this video. Now it wouldn't be complete if we didn't also talk about the pros that the ARMA model has, which we are giving up. We have to accept there's trade-offs here. And so one of the biggest pros of the ARMA model, because it's so simple, is that it was really quick to train an ARMA model. It's just a linear model of the stock returns that came five or 10 days before. Not too much complicated stuff going on. Now, compare that to the LSTM model, which has a lot of complicated stuff going on. That's exactly why we're using it. There's all these gates, there's the cell state, there's all these things going on in there. But that means it's gonna be a lot slower to train and that's something we would have to accept. 
Also on the interpretability front, we hinted at the ARMA model being really easy to explain to your friend who maybe doesn't have a lot of experience in stats even or stock price prediction or time series analysis. But the LSTM model we saw took a whole 35 minute video for us to go through last time because there's so many moving pieces and therefore we have to give up some interpretability but are hopefully gaining some performance, some better accuracy in this stock return prediction along the way. And another big drawback is that the ARMA model had very few parameters. And by parameters here, I really mean hyperparameters. We had a whole video on hyperparameters. I'll link in the description below. But basically, hyperparameters just inform how your machine learning model works independent of what training data you're feeding into that model. The ARMA model has relatively few of them, but the LSTM model, again, comes back to this point that it's a rather complex model, has a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of dials and levers we're allowed to turn in dictating exactly how our LSTM model is allowed to work. And if we wanted to do our due diligence, we would have to try every single combination of those dials and levers in order to know whether the LSTM model we're training is truly the best one we could have trained. Now that presents a problem when you take that in hand with the fact that an LSTM model is much slower to train because now you're thinking about all these different combinations of hyperparameters. Each one's gonna take a really long time to train and you need to run this whole process once every day because you need to know what stocks to buy on the next day. And it can become really computationally expensive. And so we might be forced to make certain trade-offs here, like not trying every single combination of hyperparameters, but just trying a couple that make sense to us in order to cut down on this computational complexity. So that said, with the cons and pros addressed, let's get into exactly how this LSTM stock return prediction is going to work. So when we train this model on a given ticker symbol, we're going to take the historical returns and also volumes of that stock over a 30 day period. So you see here is April 10th all the way to May 9th. And we have another column here for the return of that stock. So the opening to closing price on that day, gained 1% this day, shrank by half a percent this day and so on and so on and so on. And we also have this new additional column which we hinted at before, which tells you how many total shares of that stock were traded on that given day. So you see here it's 21 million, here it's 17 million, and so on and so on and so on. And we talked through before why this could be a good feature in order to feed the model, because the volume or the amount of activity happening for a certain stock on a given day can be indicative about what that stock's return will be in the next day. And so this table represents one training example that we're going to feed while training our long short-term memory LSTM model. And what our output of that long short-term memory model is gonna be after we feed it many, many such examples like this. So this is just one 30-day period. If you shift all these dates forward by one, you'll have another 30-day period. If you shift all those dates forward by one again, you'll have another 30-day period. Each of those is going to be an example that we feed into training our LSTM. And each time we feed one example, we're going to be asking the model to predict the probability that the next day's return is positive. And so this is one divergence from the ARMA model where we were predicting the exact stock return and predicting a confidence interval around that stock return. Instead, in this video, we're gonna be just predicting, give me a probability between zero and one, that tomorrow's return is going to be a positive number. And as you would expect, at the end, we're gonna do some kind of sorting on which stocks have the highest predicted probability here and buy those stocks accordingly and proportionally to this probability. But let's continue the story to understand that a little bit better. So to help us better understand exactly how this model is going to work, here we have a diagram version of what it means to feed one training example, namely this exact same training example who we saw in tabular form here, into the network. So you see that each of these blocks is an LSTM cell, which is a certain point in time. So this block is one day, this block is the next day, this block is the next trading day, and so on and so on and so on. So what happens at each block? We're not gonna fully review the architecture of LSTMs here because we have a whole video on that. So I'll just walk through what's getting fed in where. So the first day we feed in the stock return and the stock's volume, trading volume on that day. And so that's just a small two dimensional vector here. So we feed that as our X1, our first example in the first time step. Now inside here, it's pretty much a black box or a blue box, if you will. But inside here is happening all the magic with the gates and computing the cell state, computing the hidden or output states. And so this first time period, this first cell, is going to output the first cell state, which again is tracking these long-term helpful dependencies in the network, which is more robust to the vanishing gradient problem than simple vanilla recurrent neural networks. And also we're passing forward H1, which is the hidden, which is one and the same as the output state in LSTMs. Now with the hidden state, because it's also the output state, we're gonna feed that through sigma, 
which is a fully connected layer, followed by a sigmoid activation function, and that spits out p hat 2, which is the predicted probability that the second day's stock return is going to be positive. Now we just continue the story. The second day now has access to the information from the previous day, both the first cell state and also the first output or hidden state, and also gets access to this new information x2, which itself is a two-dimensional vector containing return and also volume on that second day. We feed that into the second cell and it outputs a second cell state C2 and a second hidden state H2. That hidden state goes into also the fully connected layer and spits out the predicted probability that the next day of stock return is going to be positive, P hat 3. And that's basically it. We just repeat, we just copy paste the same cell structure as many times as we want, as many time periods as we would like to take into account information for, so that at any given point in time, we're able to output a prediction that the next day's stock return is going to be positive. And finally in this video, let's talk through the process we are going to use. So we're still going to train one model on Monday through Friday. We're trading $1,000 in this video. And so we're going to be trading $200 on any given day of the week. 200 times 5 gives you $1,000 total. And so for every ticker in the S&P 500, we're going to get the last 90 days of data for this ticker. And we're going to create training examples, which are one month plus one day. And so this begs a little bit of explanation. So you have this 90 day period for your stock, let's say Microsoft stock. You're gonna take the first 30 days of the stock and you're going to feed that as one training example when training your LSTM. And the label is going to be that extra day after that one month for what the stock return really was on that day, whether it was positive or not. And so we we'll use that training data and that label to tune all of the weights that exist in this model so that at the end of the day, the model we have is doing a good job of predicting the stock return on the next day. And then to create the next training example, we simply shift that one month plus one day window forward by one trading day so that the new 30 days becomes the next training example we feed in and the one day after becomes the label that we are trying to predict and so on and so on and so on and so on. So we do that for all 90 days here. Now we train the LSTM on half of the training examples we generated and we validate the LSTM on the other half. So it has access to the first half of training examples we generate, does not have the ability to see the second half of training examples we generate. That is the half we're going to use to validate whether we're actually doing a better job at predicting this P hat than by just simple random guessing. And that simple random guessing is what gives us the baseline accuracy. So for example, let's say the baseline accuracy is 50% for a given stock. So you could basically just say it's going to grow the next day or it's not going to grow the next day and that'll give you a 50% accuracy. Now let's say that using this LSTM gives you a 54% accuracy. And so that would be an improvement on the baseline accuracy. So by 4%. Now it's possible that for other ticker symbols, we don't actually get an improvement or in rare cases actually somehow end up worse than random guessing. And so those will not make it into our shortlist. So we're only going to shortlist those who we do get an improvement for. And there's an interesting additional case that I'll mention here. We're also not going to shortlist those whose improvement is too high. So it makes sense why we wouldn't shortlist those who don't show any improvement because there's no evidence here that this is actually a good model to predict that stock. But also why would we disregard those whose improvement was above 10%? And the reason for that is because we haven't actually done backtesting in this process. It's a little bit subtle to see why we haven't done it, but the reason is because we had this 90 day period and like we said, we ran one month plus one day windows and we rolled that all the way down. And so it kind of seems like we did do back testing because we had this nature of a rolling window going down. But the reason we didn't actually do back testing is because of this line here, because we always train the LSTM on the first half of this data here. And we always validate the LSTM on the second half of this data here. If we want to do proper, proper back testing here, we would actually need to go all the way back to the first step where it says get the last 90 days. And then after doing this process once, we need to shift our 90 day window one day backwards and repeat this process. Then we need to shift that 90 day window one day backwards again and repeat this process. Because the risk we're running into here by not doing proper, proper back testing is that you're always looking at the same 90 day window for every single ticker symbol. And so if you're only looking at that 90 day window and you're training on the first half and you're validating on the second half, there's a very valid case to be made here that you're not generalizing here. You're not taking into account what this process's actual performance would be on any arbitrary historical time period. And so we have a couple options here. The obvious one is just to go do proper proper backtesting. But then we run into these cons of the LSTM model where it's going to take a really really long time to train. And so we're going to strike a balance and instead say that if any improvement is above 10%, 
we're going to call that just unrealistic, especially given we're talking about stock return prediction here, because we know that's inherently a really hard problem and experts struggle with this. And I wouldn't consider us super, super experts at this yet. And so we're going to do some kind of regularization instead here, where we're going to say, you know what? We're not going to do proper, proper backtesting here because of the computational complexity involved. But we are going to disregard anything that's showing returns that just don't seem realistic. Now, where'd I get this 10%? Somewhat arbitrary. You could set this lower, you could set this higher, depending on your tolerance for risk. But that's one of the parameters you can set in this model. And so we're going to be only keeping those, only shortlisting those tickers who show an improvement greater than zero, but less than 10%. Now of those shortlisted, we're going to proportionally invest our $200 to what the probability that the next day stock return will be positive. And so that is really the whole process, folks. So there's definitely a lot of improvements to be made to this method right off the bat, some of which we talked about and some of which we probably didn't. And we'll learn those when we look at the review video in one week. And I'm sure many of you will also point out some in the comments below and we'll learn from those as well. But hopefully this makes enough sense for now. And so as always, check back in here in one week to see how we did using the LSTM model in order to trade stocks.